Donald? Yes, I started the recording, but now yes. you're out of focus. Yes, I'm out of focus. Okay. Much better. It's adjusting. You see, it's uh, it's a smart camera. Smart camera knows when I'm talking bullshit and it takes me out of focus. Okay. Now we can we can make a recording. So, so let me recall two things. First, what is our general plan? You see that I created during the cold winter. First, very general. Higher topological quantum field theory. To do what? To understand something. So, being Russian, I would like to say everything. But I need to know that my plans are too fantastic. That's why I'm realistic. I'm making correction to understand something about quantum field theory. Second, to understand universal string theory. Edward Witten. Third, understand it's higher dimensional generalizations. And to get various consequences of all this. So it's kind of ambitious plan. You see, I started with one and here is a big tree. You see, actually what I will try to tell you should look like a tree, but the time is a line and I cannot explain it as a tree. So I'll do my best. Okay, that's why it's not the, the direct way from one place to another place. Unfortunately, it's like a tree. Maybe it will also have loops because after understanding something, we will have to come back to initial place, not initial, but somewhere here, and to rethink what happens again and again. But it's a matter of life. Every interesting thing is not a line. Every interesting thing is uh, at least has at least complexity of a graph, right? Okay. So now, where I am this plan? I started with this HTQFT. And uh, I gave you example in dimension equal to one. Okay, HQTFT is a closed, what you should remember, closed uh, function. Okay. From cobordisms to Tensor algebra of complexes. So, if you know already this, if you know this, it is it would be good if you understand something that this is the main object. 
I would be satisfied. You will know something. Moreover, this has examples in dimension one, dimension two, and of course we keep a door to higher dimensions, but we will start with the simplest examples, one and two. So in dimension one, This cobordism basically leads to the main map from the integral from the interval of the length of t to the operator that has a form. Well. There is Q square equal to zero, G square equals to zero, and H is anti commutator of Q and G. Good. So we got it from D equals one. Now, there are several examples. Example one. where Q is D and uh, okay, here I say that Q and G belong to endomorphism of the Z to grade space. Q is D, G is D star, H is Laplace. Example two. Q is D, G is IV. Hamiltonian is LV, Lie derivative. And also example three. Do you see what's written here? Donald? Yes. Okay. You see, I, I, I'll keep putting these things every time so you can in this journey recall where did we start and what are we doing here in this field full of snow so example three is v equals v tilde times c squared Q is H tilde zero zero zero. G is zero 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 one. H is H tilde H tilde zero. While I'm going on you'll understand more and more why this example is the prototype of what is called universal A model. This is a prototype of what is called bosonic string theory. And this example one I would like to say could be changed into example 1.5. And in example 1.5, you have D bar, you have D bar star. And this is the B model. So understanding of these examples would tell you something about in dimension two topological B strings, topological A strings, bosonic strings, and their various generalizations and uh, interactions between each other in different dimensions. Okay. But these are promises, you see. 
so what I am doing during this course, I am trying to realize this promise. So things are uh, pretty clear. So in dimension one, however, they are not that clear. So uh, I mentioned that already in dimension one, there are two type of divergences. And uh, these divergences are Okay, so after you see these examples, I, I erase this function. You see, when we'll know more, we will come back to this notion of function, but we will try how to modify this definition, how to improve, how to do many other things. But we need a starting point. We need to get involved in the business. So, interesting things. In dimension equal to one, we have two types of what you say, phenomena. You see, I just wanted to call it problems, but things that's one people would call problems, other people would call phenomena. Okay. So uh, they are related to the following thing. The interval of length t has a moduli space that is r plus the length of the interval. And this R plus has two types of boundaries. Ultraviolet, so-called. So I assume that some people uh, heard about quantum field theory. So ultraviolet is zero that belongs to R plus. Very small interval. And infrared, infinity plus infinity that of course does not belong to R plus, but we understand what, what does it mean. Very long distance. So where do we meet this divergence? Oh, problems or phenomena. We meet it when we do the following. This object belongs to the differential forms on R plus. Times and over. Closeness means that it is reasonable to integrate it over R plus in integration over R plus we have divergences divergences and these divergences are related to the infrared problem it's one type of phenomenon Another type of phenomenon. Before uh, I'll come to the second type of phenomena, let me give you some philosophical remark. And let me recall a story that happened with uh, Albert Schwartz in the fifties, when he was a postgraduate, 
and he was giving a seminar on the low dimensional topology together with uh, some other people in Moscow State University. And uh, while he was uh, organizing this seminar, there was a great mathematician, Alexander, academician, who was doing uh, topology of uh, infinite dimensional spaces. So he was pa passing by the seminar and he said, hmm. seminar on topology, I am the greatest specialist in topology. And then the folklore said that Albert Solomonich was said that yes, of course, but we are interested in the simple system with complex properties and not in the complex system with simple properties. So uh, according to the folklore, uh, Alexander was a bit insulted and uh, it had some consequence. So let us call it the Albert Schwartz rule. That it's uh, good to study not complex system with simple properties, but a simple system with complex properties, because we are interested not in systems, we are interested in properties, because it's a property, properties that we observe. Okay, and uh, another great Russian mathematician, Vladimir Arnold, and in parallel, I think, Toma, or Tom, from France, created a theory of catastrophes. And the idea is that when you deform a theory, you have universal phenomena. And it doesn't matter if you deform just polynomial or you deform the airplane, something in the airplane, or you deform the rules of the society. These are systems of very different complexity, however, phenomena are the same. And uh, they realize that you need to study deformations. Okay? So what is the interesting in any system? In any system, uh, it's interesting how can you deform it? So all this was uh, to explain that when we have this functor, we are interested not only in the functor itself, but mostly in the space of its deformation. Okay? So it's kind of a deep idea and I hope you will understand it from one point of view or another point of view, or you will meet it in different fields of physics and mathematics, or maybe you already met it. So I, since I don't know you personally, you see, I even don't see you mostly. How can I know what I know? What do you know? So would I see your eyes? Of course, I will see that it's trivial for you or it's new for you, but I assume that uh, it is new for you. At least this point of view is new for you. So, deformations mean that you have in dimension one an observable O. Here we have T. Here we have T minus T and you integrate over dt integration of observable over the interval so it's the first order deformation and uh, as you know 
from various fields in physics and mathematics, first order deformations are called tangent space. But it's not tangent space that's most interesting. You know, when you study analysis, it's, it was always easy to take a derivative. It's not a hard problem to take a derivative at all. What, what is interesting is to see if there are so-called obstructions. Obstruction means that you continue to go this way and you just cannot go. Basically, it's something like the second derivative or potential, okay? Some abstraction. So it is interesting that this abstraction have, uh, could be expressed here. So in some sense, observables are interested not only because we can observe them, but also because they deform the factor, okay? And if you continue this deformation to the second order, you have T1, T2, T minus T1 plus T2. To the second order, you have this. Two observables moving. And uh, sometimes they meet together. And if you consider this as a differential form, or you may consider, uh, so if you consider this as differential form, it's closed. However, configuration space has boundaries. And on these boundaries, you can have singularities or discontinuities or whatever. So you can have boundaries and the boundaries correspond to ultraviolet problem. Let's say like when T2 goes to zero. T2 goes to zero, you go, go all the way around. So ultraviolet calls obstructions. And uh, we studied some example that looked silly because they are from linear algebra. But already in linear algebra, you could see this phenomenon. Now, what is the reason to go to two dimension two? The one reason is that two is uh, bigger than one. And when you go to higher dimensions, you expect to have, to have more complexity. So maybe Albert Solomonovich Schwartz would not recommend us in his young years to go to higher dimensions. Why should we do this? We should study all phenomena in dimension equal to one. However, there is something in dimension two that is different from dimension one. Boundary of S of, of ball one, of one dimensional ball, it's an interval, is S zero, it is, it is point plus, it has two components. Okay. 
Of course, with science. Boundary of two dimensional ball. is S1. It has one component. Maybe you can see here that there is a disk and the boundary of the disk is a circle. That's why local observables are very different in dimension one and dimension two. In dimension equal to one, boundary corresponds to the vector space. A local observable, it's a boundary of the interval, corresponds to V times V star. They're very different. In dimension equal to two, a boundary corresponds to V and local observable. That corresponds to the boundary of the shrinking ball. also corresponds to the space V. And in dimension two and also in higher dimensions, we have so-called state operator correspondence. Okay. Then let me imagine Albert Salomon Schwartz, who is a great mathematician and who always anticipates things that would, that would happen in 10 or 20 years. Nobody knows why, but uh, it is his uh, habit. That's why he is not as popular as he has to be. Because to be popular, we need to anticipate in uh, two or three years. And he anticipates uh, too far. And uh, people just don't understand him. OK. So he would say that it's, uh, so what, he would ask. And now we say that another thing that we happen in dimension two is a very strange phenomenon. If theory is conformal, then infrared equals to ultraviolet. Hmm? So we will say this is something new. How could it ever be that infrared equals to ultraviolet? So you may go to simple physicists and physicists would say, it's complete nonsense. Infrared means big distances. Ultraviolet means small distances. How they could be equal? But then the physicist who is doing conformal field theory or mathematicians would say, this is our standard imagination of the things. What actually happens is that you should not just say that they are different because we're used to this. Just read conformal. You see, each word in mathematics is sensible. You just put one word 
and you change the full uh, structure. You see, here is the. You see, it happens in different languages. That in the Russian language, in Russian language, if you change one word in the sentence, you could not change the meaning of the sentence completely. In some sense, everything else besides this word already carries some information you cannot destroy. In German language, you have very interesting uh, grammatic expression. It's called nicht. When you say something and then you say nicht, you mean that you destroyed whatever you said before. Okay? And uh, that's why there is a cultural difference between Russians and Germans. The Russians just cannot uh, tolerate when you are building something, building something, and then you have to destroy it. They cannot tolerate it in their mentality. But Germans with their language, they say nicht, and that means everything goes away. Okay? So, Let us read the word conformal field theory. So let us see how Russian reads it. Field theory. Field. So Russian imagines something like a field, like a function. Well, there is something here. And you imagine the big field of a rich farmer and the small field, okay? And this is in your mind. And when somebody says, conformal field theory, you say, okay, it's also field theory, but with some other property. I don't know, maybe you have here uh, not uh, wheat, uh, but rice, maybe you have water here, like people have in China. Maybe you even have here uh, palms, uh, I don't know, fruit trees, but still it's a field. But this word conformal is exactly like German word nicht. It means, while it's still called field theory, it's very different thing. It means that the big field is equivalent to the small field because the size of the field doesn't matter. Okay. So if you will think like Russian, you could not understand it. How a single letter could completely change the intuition of what is going on. But if you think as as a German, you would say, look, nicht, or conformal. Big things are equal to small things, okay? It is a C. It's very dangerous letter. It's very important letter. Okay, like nicht. So that's why I'm stressing it. Maybe you understand it in your, because in your mentality, it's, it's not a problem, but I am Russian. I cannot tolerate easily that a single letter could completely change my intuition, you see? That's why for me as a Russian, This phenomena, infrared equals to ultraviolet, or big field equals to small field. You see, what does it mean? It would mean for Russians that the big Russia 
is uh, equivalent to the small uh, country. You see, you know, Russians are very proud that they are big. And, uh, but somebody tells them that it's not that important of being big. Hmm? So Russians could not tolerate it, but uh, still. We have to admit the fact that there are conformal field theories. Something that is very hard to understand for Russians. I told you for two reasons. Because conformal and Russia somehow contradict each other. You see? For Russians, the space means a lot. Okay? So how could be that infrared equals ultraviolet? So I will explain it to Russians. I hope people from other cultures do not have this problem. But I don't know, you see. In different mentality is different. Maybe for Chinese people, this is also impossible. How can you do this? So this is exponential uh, explanation for Russians and uh, maybe also for people for some, uh, from other culture. So you have observable O1, you have observable O2. And this O2 go, comes together to O1. And here you have the small distance R. So to understand what is going on, let us assume that the disk has a radius one. So here we have R and here we have one. So ultraviolet means R goes to zero. Yes, we are coming to small distances. Hmm? But now we do this Conformal transformation. That you can do in mathematics, but, but something that Russians cannot imagine. You may con you conformally transform this to the following. So here you have a standard disk. And here you have a cylinder of the length L. And then just imagine that these two pictures are conformally equivalent. That R going to zero is equivalent to L going to infinity, you see. I, I have to keep in mind that R is small, that's why I write it with a small letter R. I should keep in mind that L is going to be big. I put it with a big letter L. But you can make a conformal transformation. So I'll recall uh, it for students who, who have never did it. So this disk is of radius R, and this is, uh, is of radius one. I will do this conformal transformation. So here I have zero, here I have one. I would like to recall this small R to this one. So this should have a length 
1 over r. Okay? Small r means that this, this, this is big. Ah, it helps me a bit. But then I'd like to go from this picture to this picture. So I'll make a formal transformation again. And this is the exponential map. Okay. To take n loose to a cylinder. So one over r should be e to the L. So when L goes to infinity, R goes to zero. But you see, when I drew you, drew you these two pictures, pictures, it's hard to believe that they are related, especially because they are related using this crazy relation, but they are actually related. Okay. So now, in conformal field series, infrared and ultraviolet are the same. Could you believe it or not? They are the same. And then, and then I will uh, act like Russian would act. So when Russian meets German, and German people say, "Look, in the rule in the law that I have, it's written nicht." And then you know. Uh, in Russian, in Russia, we don't like to go to work according to law. We do not respect law a lot because we say, look, laws are done by people. People are more or less like us. They could make mistakes. Uh, so okay. we believe in common sense. Should and we have a break? Should we have a break? It's uh, 40, 50 minutes, really. Uh, I'm uh, right. Last sentence, and we will have a break. Okay. So, uh, exactly. So, a Russian would say, please give me, please show me how it works. Give me an example. Where can you see uh, that big field is uh, equivalent to a small field? You are writing that it's a description of the of the machine that you are bringing, and uh, here the reaction of German is, ah, stupid Russian, you do not trust me. Yes, you do not trust instruction that is that is written for the German German machine. Okay, and then German gives Russian a machine that works according to instruction. And then the Russian says, okay, you convinced me, yes, it can work. And that's why I, I will not, I am not only telling you that in conformal theory, infrared equals to ultraviolet, but I, will, I am trying to provide you a machine, an example, where it actually happens. Okay, and this machine was something that I was trying to explain to you last time that I'll continue last time. It is a constructive, not axiomatic, but constructive, conformal, two-dimensional theory that you can touch just as Russian farmer could touch German Mercedes Benz. Okay, and this is the break. Then, okay? Okay, thank you. 
By the way, during the break, it's possible to ask questions. <coughs> so, uh, so what is the plan for, for the lecture? So we are going to discuss about the uh, two-dimensional tonic theory uh, from conformal field series. So we are going to discuss the two-dimensional instantonic theory as a workable model mm -hmm. that is conformal from the definition that has no blank constant that uh, has no that could be treated without field field without uh, free fields and this is one side and also, simultaneously, I will tell you how to discuss this same model using free fields with some modifications. And this is called AIB idea of Lossi and Frankel. So this, uh, so this approach, uh, we don't need a, a PV formula. Later on, okay. Later on, we can see we will see this as an example of BV. You see, whenever we have a formalism, it is uh, good to have an example immediately after we have a formalism. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, Lyova Sukhanov. So when I started this, and I explained, and I started to explain general infrared problems, he told me it is too dry. Nobody will listen to you because you are describing general structures, and people like to have example in mind. Uh, and yes. once again, because Lyova Sukhanov. Uh, is a person uh, with Russian mentality. So you trust axioms or you trust laws only if uh, you have at least one example when they are working. In mathematical logics, there is a way to prove uh, 
the consistency of the system of axioms. You show at least one model where uh, axioms work. And that means that they are consistent. But uh, people have not uh, succeeded uh, in constructing conformal field theory by using a BV. Not, not yet. You see, Sam, yes. when, when you say people, I would say there are many people. So, okay. so, so uh, as a Chinese person, you know that there are a lot of people, you see. Yes. And, uh, and some people uh, succeed, some people not. And moreover, people that uh, succeed could not explain to people who do not succeed that they succeed. So yes. when, you, when you have a lot, a lot of people, you have an advantage that you always have something interesting somewhere. But mm -hmm. you have a problem of communication. People who understand something have to convince the rest that they actually understood something. And uh, you see, would it be in the small country like Iceland, where you could all fit, where you could put all uh, scientists in one room. It would be easy to yes. to get understanding. If you have a lot of people, you see, then you have so-called common opinion, and you have uh, alternative opinion. And as you know, the main problem is misunderstanding. You see, what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to fight with misunderstanding because there is something that actually happens and there is something uh, that uh, people think is true as a common opinion. Here I just explained why common is the first part, one common opinion that infrared could not be equal to ultraviolet. However, it happens. And, uh, and the, same, the same happens with all common opinion. And moreover, when you show one example where a system of axioms works, you will convince other people that maybe there are other examples and other examples that are even more interesting than examples that you show. But first you need to show that the object exists. Okay. Mm. And it's very hard to, to choose what to, dis, what to explain first, the object or the structure. The structure is more fundamental, but you would not trust it before you see the object. The object, however, the object itself is too restrictive. So we have to develop two things in parallel. Objects and objects and structures. So, what it would be the uh, the role of uh, two-dimensional instantonic theory in constructing conformal field theory? Instantonic conformal field instantonic conformal field theory could be considered as as an alternative uh, starting point for constructing conformal field theory. So conformal field theory is, uh, is a big field and yes. you can study it from different places. One place to start is uh, free fields. And we have a lot of experience with it. So instantonic theories is another starting point. Okay. And not only in dimension two, 
instantonic uh, field theory is an alternative starting point uh, in constructing uh, other types of quantum field theories in other dimensions. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. However, it's a starting point. It's not the emperor, you see. It's just another starting point. Uh, so the best point of view would be if you have two starting points. Okay, it's like a function. You can expand it at one point. You can expand it at another point. Mm -hmm. And it's better to see that uh, two series uh, coincide while, while they overlap, right? So, so would I be German? I would ask why it is uh, pragmatic. What is the role of it? And I, and I am trying to convince you that uh, instantonic uh, starting point corresponds exactly to alpha prime to zero in uh, string theory. So this is to describe so-called soft physics. It means, uh, you see, when I say soft, you say, you think that uh, I'm so uh, that I'm talking about silly things. Soft physics, and I I came from high energy physics. I came from particles, and in particles we know that everything is strong. And soft is I don't know some chemistry nuclear fields uh, something that i don't like however from the point of view of string theory whatever we do in our accelerators is a soft physics it's the hard physics is where you have the Planck mass we don't have Planck mass so we need to admit that we are soft okay yes from the point of view of string theory what we call high energy physics should be considered low energy physics. You see? Yes, yes, of course. Yes. And low energy physics means that uh, Planck mass is big or goes to infinity. It means that alpha prime is small. So, so this is about the limit alpha prime going to zero. That's why it's important from the point of view of string theory. From the point of view of field theory, instantonic limit is the limit when the, when two things happen. When the, when the gauge coupling constant is small. Okay, but it's perturbative region, region. And also in the region when the theta angle is imaginary and big. Okay, so we have to imagine this. But uh, take perturbation in theta angle is not that uh, undoable. So it's a reasonable. So it's the reason number two <clears throat> why to do this. Reason number three is that uh, in uh, some topological twisted series, this alpha prime or epsilon that I described, described above is even exact. Okay? So if you are exact in homological world, it means that you are zero. So it is the third reason. So once again, instantonic series are important for these three reasons. So how can I explain why it's important to study a two-dimensional sphere? Because it's the simplest compact manifold. Because it's a uh, manifold that belongs to the class of uh, spheres. 
because it's also CP, because it's also CP1, because it's also homogeneous space, okay? Two-dimensional sphere is good for many reasons. Like smartphone, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. However, as you know, you should not restrict yourself to study of two-dimensional sphere. You should uh, study spheres in different dimensions, yes. You should study projective spaces in different dimensions. You should study homogeneous spaces in different dimensions, etc. yes. And when you go, say, from two-dimensional sphere to three-dimensional sphere, you can even see the group as you do. That's even better. And you can go all over the groups even. You see, that's why, so Stan, have I convinced you? So I consider instantonic theories as a family, like a family of spheres or projective spaces in geometry. Hmm. Not all uh, spaces are just projective spaces or homogeneous spaces, but uh, they provide a huge class of examples. Hmm. Solvable, doable, understandable, with a lot of symmetries when you can localize, write explicit formulas, do topology, whatever you want. Okay? Hmm. Okay. So we'll continue. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, so I am continue. I'd like to continue with my uh, example of uh, two cultures, German culture and Russian culture. So in Russia, we had a lot of land and a lot of farmers, but they were poorly organized. So Russian emperors, decided to import Germans to be managers. And uh, when Germans became managers, things went much better. So it was combination of uh, Russian land together with the German organization uh, culture, technological culture, and later uh, machines. And uh, it led to success of Russian Empire until it blew up for some different reasons, you see. So, So that's what I'm going to, so I'm coming to this example. So just imagine that I am a German, poor German. There was a lot of Germans, not enough land. 
and who he, he is the youngest uh, son of the noble family, no property, no money, and he was sent to Russia. And he met Russian farmers, and he was trying to teach them somehow how to use the Western technology. So he, so you see, Russian farmers were not stupid, but you see technology, this technology and this organization were just new to them. So uh, you see, I am trying to explain to you what what you can do, just like a German immigrant to Russia who was trying to show something to Russian farmers. And Russian farmers are wise to ask why this is working, how it is working. And before they know it, they will never use it. So. So that's how I am bringing to use this instantonic series. So in D equals to one, so we can study what's going on in D equals to one, but this is kind of a test run, you see? It's just like German uh, farmer who brought a tractor or something or tool and turns out engine and you see how it is doing like dug, 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 dug. but this is not convincing Russian farmer so things becomes more convincing and interesting in dimension two okay when there was the main equation instantonic equation you write it in coordinate and you will say it's holomorphicity. And you can solve this equation explicitly. You can write down explicit formulas. Then let me recall. What are you doing with this? What can you do with this? First, you can have differential forms. I'll write them like omega, x, and psi. I call it omega, not a function, just to recall you that these are differential forms. I am writing it as a function of x and psi just to tell you that you should treat them, treat it as a function. So, the first thing that you can do, you can integrate over the space of holomorphic maps these things evaluated at psi one, at psi at the end. So what does this mean to take these things and evaluate? It means actually that you have a map from holomorphic maps times Riemann surface to the target X. It is called Eve evaluation map. So I graduated from Russia, from physical and technical institute that is exactly Russian analog of USCC. 
and uh, they were pretending that they are giving us more than mathematics. However, they never stressed that there is a very important map called evaluation because they thought it's obvious. So later on, I realized that some people understand that there is a universal map called evaluation that has two arguments, map and the point, and you go to the manifold. So people think it's obvious, that's why they are missing this point. Now, If you have a map, you see, it's good to call map F, right? If you have a point Z, it goes to F of Z. Now, there was another thing that people uh, never told me in this uh, Russian analog of USTC, that there is a pullback so pullback means that if one goes to another say y goes to x then functions on x go back they assumed it as obvious But some mathematicians told me that you are, if you are not just an engineer, you should know that not only functions go back, but also differential forms go back. So you have a pullback of the differential form. Okay. So this pullback of differential form belongs to where? Of course, it belongs to differential forms on whole times sigma. So being a differential form, it is differential form as a product. Being a differential form on a product, it has, it has different components. Some components along whole, some components along sigma. So what does this mean? This, when I put here Z1, means that I take zero component along sigma and all components along whole. That's why here I have a differential form on the space of holes. And that's why I can integrate. Good. So the simplest example of what, the simplest example is when when I have a constant map, then it's not that interesting. Then it means that uh, evaluation is just x, and uh, I am just integrating the product of differential forms on x. Things become more interesting when I have actual polymorphic maps. So the pullback means that psi goes to D of what? If X 
is C like this, then Psi goes to D of this along what? Along parameters A, B, C. And that's what exactly I wrote last time. You plug it here and you integrate. And I told you that it's an example that you may do. Well, you may think that, that, that that's all. And I told you that it's very interesting to study this thing as a ring. You may ask, is this theory conformal? I would say yes. Because equations do, does not depend on metrics. Nothing depends on metric. This space is finite dimensional. Just integrate. But you have to be careful because potentially you can have divergences. This space is not compact. You need to check that. Uh, you need to check that uh, the integral converges. So let us keep this point. However, it could be very interesting to check if these integrals are convergent or not. I put warning. Check the convergence. Oh, it is interesting, and we studied it with uh, Nikrasov and Frankel, that if you take derivative with respect to Z, you would get divergences. And then you will have to regularize, and you will have anomalous dimensions. So here is phenomena. You might get divergences that would lead to anomalous dimensions. It is very interesting to study this phenomena. I was Nikrasov and frankly found something, but we just started this. It is not studied in full details, even on CP1. When you have divergences, when you don't have divergences, then you may ask, how do I know that divergences in the integral of a holomorphic map are related to anomalous dimensions, while these are related to conformal transformation. And the answer is as follows. Look, here is the space of holomorphic maps. It's like this. It has no, this space has no, uh, scale at all. Moreover, if you make conformal transformation in Z, you can compensate it with conformal transformation on parameters A, B, C. So old physicists were saying that it means that instantons have a size and this size could be big or small. We will call, we will come back to the question of the size of the instanton later. However, look, if I start having divergences here, I would immediately have a problem. I'll try to regularize them. But if I'll try to regularize them, I'll put additional data. 
And this data may violate conformality. You see? It's, it sounds interesting. It sounds novel. You have divergence, potential divergence. You regularize. You are breaking symmetry. You renormalize. And you have the renormalized theory with the normal of dimension. Okay? New phenomena. However, uh, this phenomenon is known from the old approach to conformal field theories. Recall. How did we got an almost damage before? You said you have this so called take on observable. It is something that everybody knows from conformal field theory. Okay? So naive, naive approach. You have Lagrangian. That is like this, free field. Okay. Naively, X has dimension zero. Because this has dimension one, this is one together, it has dimension zero. You want to study such observables. You think that they have dimension zero. Okay? How, how can you study correlator of such observables? Using functional integral. Good. You do not expect any problems at the moment. You say, ah, oh, look, these are nice observables. Because when I put these observables in the functional integral, I have quadratic integral. Okay? You say, oh, I'll compute it using uh, shift of variables. So you may think that result is pi i pi j green function. Where g z i z j equals log the i minus the g. Ah, you think you are done. Not really, because g the i the i equals infinity. Ah, here you have a problem. Let us recall this problem. So what can you do? You say, ah, let us say I non equals to J. If you say I not equals to J, 
It is not the German way to do things. It's a Russian way to do things. You know, if Russians uh, meet a law that they cannot obey, you know what Russians are doing? They are ignoring this law, okay? So if you act like Russians, just say I'm not equal to J. You get a finite answer. And you may say, ah, oh, this is exactly what is written in books. Hmm? So this is a typical Russian way to overcome problems. Do it like this. However, if you are a German, you would say no. You cannot do it like this. You cannot just throw away something. What does it mean? This is a Gaussian integral. This is a good working tool. How can, how can you throw away something from the Gaussian integral? You should try to understand what is going on. Not throwing things away. Let us see what happens. You need to have a look at what is going on. And you can see that in order to compute this thing, you need to compute x classical. That depends on z. Of course, pi z i. That should solve equation of motion. The pressure of x should equal sum pi delta of z minus z i. And then you have to compute s of x classical. This would be the result. Then, if sum of p's equals to zero, this equation is solvable. And of course, x is sum of logs. OK? And then, dx is dz z minus z i. Sorry, pi. It's OK. Then dx moduli square is so this is like uh, to to put the charges at the i. Then, yes. You see, you always surprised me. You originally got the mathematical education, but you are thinking exactly as physicists would say. Physicists would say, this is exactly the Coulomb problem in two dimensions. You put charges, you have fields. And the divergences that is going to be, is going to come, is exactly the divergence that uh, happens in classical field theory, where you have a uh, charge that sits at a point. And you know what? We have this proud of Russia, proud of Soviet Union, Landau Lifshitz volume on uh, classical field theory. 
they do not discuss it. They do not discuss this thing. They say, just throw it away. There is another proud of Western civilization. It's called Feynman. Course in theoretical, uh, in physics. Feynman discusses this. However, Feynman says, I actually don't know what happens. Okay? You see, difference is that uh, Landau actually was a good scientist, but a bad person, okay? I would not recommend you to keep him among your friends. So it happens. Feynman was a good physicist and a great person. That's why Landau will tell you, throw it away. And if you don't, you don't trust me, you are stupid. Just get out of my seminar. Feynman was much more kind. He said, it is a problem. It is a problem, so he expressed it in his uh, course on uh, physics that two pieces of a so electron could not be a point, otherwise you have infinite uh, energy. And you cannot just throw it away. Because it's physics, it's not uh, things where we are throwing things away. You study what you are throwing away. And he said, maybe, so Feynman, Feynman said, maybe electron, he said, is actually a sphere of a small size. And then there is no problem of this uh, infinite energy of electric field. But then Feynman, Feynman says, two pieces of the sphere would repel from each other with the infinite strength. How can you put them together? You see, being a great person, he kept this in his uh, Feynman course on, on uh, physics. He was convincing himself. He did not have to prove to other people that he is great. So he could uh, confirm that there is a problem. Okay? So we are coming exactly, Sam, as you mentioned, exactly to this problem, exactly to this issue. Here we have several pieces. One piece is when I is less, I is not equal to J. Here you can integrate. It's not easy to integrate, but it's doable. Because as we know from analysis, this integral is doable where a bar is not zero. You can give it as a very good exercise, I exercise to your students. On a disk. To make this integral to show its properties, it would be exactly this log. Okay. You may even see that the answer would not be analytical, but still, but still it's in, 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 integral. However, there is an interesting uh, issue. The interesting issue is hmm? We see the divergence, exactly the divergence you mentioned. So let us do as Feynman proposed. Let us say that Z 
in this integral is less than r i. So we have different points. So we can choose small, small r's here. And then the integral is finite. And then you have this. Plus something R independent. When R goes to zero. Ah, we have something. Now, what we can do? We can do two things. Things number one, alpha. Regularize. Say that this thing is naive. Has no mathematical meaning. You see, I don't remember exact uh, number here, plus or minus. So this thing. And call it a reg, a regularized. So prescription is Have a point Z I cut out the region. Okay. With with R I. Compute of this thing. Over the complement. Multiply by the renormalization factor, and then take Ri going to zero. So if you, you, if you have seen the course that I was uh, giving, you may see that you have already seen such procedure. Such procedure was the definition of the local observable in the uh, Siegel definition. I told you that local observable in Siegel definition are not given, are not given. These are derived notion. So when you are cutting a sphere around the point the eye, you are doing exactly what Siegel says. And when you are taking the limit and you are putting this rescaling factor, you are doing exactly the procedure of construction of a local observable. You see, in any case, I had to come to this issue. Sooner is or this, uh, sorry, is this what uh, Feynman suggests? Almost. He basically suggested this. However, he was considering the charge placed here. And he was thinking in terms of fields, uh, in terms of strengths. The pieces have, that this charge has to repel that charge. 
So basic idea is this exactly. But uh, let me tell you one important cultural thing that I'm telling to all my students is that uh, Western physics is affected by Western culture. Sometimes this influence is good and so sometimes this influence is bad. Okay? In uh, my understanding is like this. In the East culture, people, people are going towards harmony, towards peace, towards rest and cooperation. Okay? So that's why people understand the following thing. There is a tension among people and let us minimize the tension and it will be a harmony. Okay? So that's what we are doing here when we are studying this classical uh, solution. Classical solution is extremal solution. We minimize the tension, that's it. Western culture is different. In the Western culture, people do not believe in harmony. People believe in individual peace, that each individual wants to be kept at peace. And if you move, and if you move, want to run society, you should have a boss, boss pushes you, you push some other people, and this is called force. So in English language, there's a notion to force someone to do something, okay? Not you are coming together to do something. Force, you force something to do something. So Newton was great saying that there is resistance. If one forces somebody something to do something, it forces you also. But if you have a bigger mess, you don't feel it, okay? But still, the idea of force comes from the Western culture. The idea of harmony comes from the Eastern culture. In the West, there is individual peace and nirvana, if you wish, and rest. In the East, there is collective, you see? Collective happiness, collective rest. That's why this wrong idea of force is inside Western physics. And that's why Feynman would think that pieces of this sphere would have to act on each other because they are repelling, because of this idea of force. In this construction, you do not need even to think about forces. So force is a misconcept. Because of the Western point of view on what is going on. Okay? So this is the Feynman cultural problem. So if you take this cultural problem problem out of what he said, then it's exactly what he has to say. Yes, take an electron of being uh, of finite size. Take the energy of electric field. Don't think about forces. Think about minimizing of the field energy. Then you get the correct result. You see? People ignore it. People don't say that it is a problem even in electrodynamics. You know, you know what they say? They say, ah, this divergence, you will study it in quantum electrodynamics. In quantum electrodynamics, they say, ah, this divergence, it's, uh, we are doing divergences like this, forget about it. And then they say, this divergence, electron is a quantum, so forget. So 
it's a wrong approach. So when you are doing a course, you should be responsible for your axiom. So if your axiom is like this, you need to study what's going on. So here you see that it is Siegel approach to observable that explains what is going on. So uh, Polyakov and Wilson would say, there is a finite size of a lattice. Siegel would say, there is no lattice. Everything is smooth. You still have this phenomena. You still have this thing. So you have anomalous dimension on coordinates. Because when you say R radius, you need to break the conformal law. In conformal law, you have, there is no radius. There is no metric. You cannot measure. Big equals to small. There is no notion of radius. OK? And this is the phenomenon of conformal anomaly. And you see, I gave this in order to show you that similarly, you can study the anomalous dimension of the vortex. Vortex. X classical is P I Z minus Z I minus. Okay, so so actually in the vortex, X classical. Okay, something like this. Very similar formula. You see, you may ask why I call it vortex. Because in the vortex, we know So this is the vortex classical solution. You actually have an argument that goes around uh, while uh, Z is going around the I. In the case of charge, you have this formula. You see, these phenomena look very different. Here you have charge. Here you have electric field. That is bigger and bigger when you come together. This is vortex. Instead, you have angle that goes around. This looks topological phenomenon. This looks 
Field theory phenomenon. Formulas are the same. When you take, when you compute the action, dx classical, you have similar formulas. You have similar phenomena. You have similar explanation of the anomalous dimension of the vortex. You see, I spent this time of my lecture in order to tell you some truth that if you define local observables as, okay, Feynman suggested and the Siegel realized, okay, and maybe Polyakov realized. you will get this anomalous dimension, not from uh, what you can say, free field contraction, etc. You are getting it from the space-time regularization. You are cutting a disk. You are turning it to zero. You see divergence. You renormalize. You regularize. This is a universal phenomenon. Moreover, I am kind of ambitious to say that this phenomena should be applied not only to two dimensional theories, but also to higher dimensional theories. But I told you that uh, in Russia during winter, during cold winter, we have different ambitious projects. Some of them are realized, some not. But this is the origin, this should be the origin of anomalous dimension. Now people study for the three dimensional theories, four dimensional theories, conformal theories, anomalous dimensions. That's how they should get uh, explained it in a universal way. So while I'm cleaning the board, I told you in the beginning of this talk that my talk is not a lie. My course is not a lie. It is a tree and sometimes it is, uh, it has loops. So I started with this. Then I go, then I went to local observer. And from this, I went to quantum mechanics, separators, etc. Then I went to two dimensional series. But here I get a new insight. This is a loop in my course. But my course is not only to this loop. I want to go further. Okay? In this two-dimensional story, I am telling you once again, I told you that every time we should uh, keep in mind what are we doing and where are we going. I was telling you that we are studying the integral. Of course, you forgot it. Over the space, but I don't. Over the space of holomorphic maps, And here we have this evaluation of differential forms. And we integrating over non-compact space. Once again, we can have divergences. because this space is not compact. And in some cases, when we may need to regularize renormalize 
and and what and publish okay you see procedure is take an integral regularize what's going it renormalize publish the result why publish because it is an example of anomalous dimension that you have in a theory with the finite dimensional integral. So these dimensions, anomalous dimensions, are not coming, as people were telling us, from the functional integral, from the fact that the integral is finite infinite dimension. No, they have different origin, at least in this case. Then they may ask me, do I mean that other people are stupid? They were telling us that these divergences are coming from loops. Okay. Of course, they are not stupid. Let us come back and see again the same issue. How we compute this correlator in the free field theory? Huh? We can write Feynman diagram. And then this Feynman diagram, we construct field with itself. So it looks like a loop. Moreover, when we compute, when we compute it, and we keep here alpha prime, so it's a crazy historic notion, but it's a standard notion. And we know that H that goes together with alpha prime. And then the anomalous dimension equals to alpha prime p square. You see h here. So from the point of view of free fields integral, you say anomalous dimension is a loop effect. And loop effect the fact that this, there, there is a loop, it diverges. It diverges at, at the low distance. You cut this loop. And this is the origin of anomalous dimension. So you may ask, who is true? Siegel, who has no free fields, no loops, but still has anomalous dimensions. Or these people, free field people. I would say, In some sense, free fields people are also true. But uh, what they see as a, what they consider as a general phenomena is just a particular phenomena in realization. They found the same phenomena. However, they found it in their model and they interpreted it as they can in the free field theory. However, phenomenon is more general. So we need to admit that people who found it as a one loop phenomena are great. They discovered it first. From their, pers from their perspective, it's a loop phenomena. 
but it is just a piece of the universal phenomenon. So if you improve your point of view, enlarge it, and forget about free fields, you will see better point of view of the picture. You will be able to understand how different anomalous dimensions are related. You will be able to find anomalous dimensions in this theory, anomalous dimensions uh, not related to Planck constant. So it's a it's much wider phenomenon. So free field computation is just uh, is just a tool. It's not the philosophy. So they are right when they found the phenomena. Good. But they are wrong when they say, when they claim that their explanation of the phenomena is unique. When they try to attribute plain constant to phenomena and so on. Okay. So I told you, here you can do something. Already here. So I think we are coming to the second break, Sam. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I for ah, it's more than longer than second. Uh, yes, but uh, then I at least I need to end in time. Okay. Then I will. You see, actually, I'm. I think that when I'm explaining things like this, it's more helpful than if I'll explain uh, the content of the article. Okay. Because the, yes, because the, the, there is something that you can read from the articles. If you would like to take integrals, you don't need me to stand in front of the blackboard or the whiteboard. Hmm. So most people could uh, compute integrals much better than I'm computing. I can make mistakes, but uh, the meaning of this course is that I'm trying to give you ideas and examples. You see? Yes. So uh, how to get the alpha prime and the p squared together as uh, Planck constant? Hmm. Gaussian integral, p square comes together with alpha prime. I see, okay. So you see when people are writing books and they're saying, now let us take h to the to one for convenience. Yes. It is a bad habit, okay? Because mm -hmm. uh, when you keep h, you always remember what is the origin of the phenomena? When does it come? Where does it come from the point of view of free fields? You see? When I am trying to explain to you the Siegel's point of view, it doesn't mean that I am saying that uh, free field point of view is wrong. It is not wrong. It is just a point of view, okay? So and it is interesting to see things in perspective from different points of view. So if you would like to think in terms of free fields, it is better to keep H bar everywhere, okay? So H bar is here, that's why But that's why what? That's why a normal dimension alpha prime p square that you can read out from everywhere is a one loop phenomenon. Okay? 
Now, when you have another, okay, when you have a vortex. And you have this solution, X classical, as it's written on the book. You have a normal dimension that goes as follows. We should recall the action. It is R square in the case of vortex. And we are plugging this thing here. And you see, we have to quantize this. We plug this thing here and we have divergence of the form R square H alpha prime, of course, yes. And this is anomalous dimension of the vortex. And when you try to make so-called T duality relating this, you should keep in mind that R square H alpha prime should go to H alpha prime. Okay. You see, I put everything together. So people used to stress that small distance are going to big distances. And this is if you look at alpha prime, it, it is inverted. However, I want to say the H bar phenomenon that the classical phenomena for vortex becomes a quantum phenomenon. And this is the example of uh, S duality, the baby example of S duality. And this, uh, this phenomena is not linear in H, okay? And it makes it interesting. It means that uh, you cannot explain S duality perturbatively in uh, H bar, okay? So it means that in order to study this, you have to study quantum field theory beyond uh, free field approach, okay? You need to do something with the H. So this is the moral. So it means that if you want to understand such phenomena, you should better use definition of quantum field theory that does not contain H bar, okay? H bar is too restricted. You see, so I am against H bar. Okay? So what I'm what I'm fighting, fight, what I'm fighting with, I am fighting with free fields 
H bar, and therefore necessity of classical action. Because if you don't have H bar, you don't have a me, you don't understand what the classical action is. My message is that so called classical action or, or even action is an effective notion, it's not a fundamental. From all my calls, I am saying that quantum field theory original, homotopical quantum field theory contains no age. It's not internal notion. It's just a symptotic notion. It's just one of the parameters. So I was taught by my teachers in 80s that Feynman introduced universal quantum field theory by writing action over H bar. And we started to think in terms of this H bar. Now I say we need to be free from free fields from the action, from H bar. Then people say, ah, if we do this, how could we work? How could we compute anything? I am giving you a simple computation, how to do it without it. One of the messages of my course is, you can work without H bar, without free fields, okay? Okay, so this is uh, for today. And the last thing I just, that, just, that I just want to say is that this is only for holomorphic maps. And there is also another issue, lambda deformed holomorphic maps. Still, I want to spend some time here. If you have lambda diff so here we have zero one four. Here we have vector field. And here is how solution looks like. You can work it out. It, it depends on uh, something like this. Just solve this equation. Or or something else. Solve this equation. Study lambda instanton. Take this integral. Take the derivative with respect to lambda and you get new observable associated to the vector field and to differential form. You can do it even better. Study this integral as the differential form over the space of lambdas. And not only take derivative, but also contract with this. You will get new observable. And correlator of these new observables could still contain divergences. Study these divergences. You will get a lot of information, a lot. 
You see? In order to to make computation, you need to know why you are doing it. Why you have to take integrals and study divergences. It's not because your professors or your teachers ask you to study. It's just uh, because a lot of interesting phenomena are captured in these divergences. And it's very instructive to study these divergences and anomalous dimensions without free fields and compare it with free field approach. Okay? So, you know, uh, I did not cover exactly the topic of what, I, of what I was planning to cover today. But I think that uh, my digression was important. Hmm. Because here, there is a lot of thing to study. I, I confirm, we have not studied it in some details. So I told you about deformed uh, algebra of the RAM. I told you about new observables before. And now I told you about anomalous dimensions. Then. I told you that there is conformal field theory without free fields and without axioms. It's a construction. Construction is better than action. Mm. That's what I started with. And you can study what's going on. And you can trace the origin of phenomena. <coughs> OK? OK. Now I think I'm, I'm over. I'll continue tomorrow and I'll continue uh, at uh, at eight Chinese time, right? Yes, yes. So tomorrow night at eight. Okay. Yes. And, st and you see tomorrow I'll tell what I was planning. I'll tell what I was planning to tell today. <laughs> okay. But you see, I, I think I gave kind of a warm up of what happens. Because you, you always have to re remember your past. In China, you know, you need to remember your history. Yes. Uh, that's good. We really want to understand what's going on. Yes. So yes. the aim of my course is to provide some kind of understanding that is different from conventional understanding. But that yes. does not contradict with conventional understanding, you see. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was a Jesus Christ in Western civilization who, who <laughs> came to Jews saying, I came not to destroy, but to improve. He is not destroying is what's called Old Testament if you heard about Christian civilization. Yes. To people who have contacts with the West, no. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I'm not destroying. I'm just giving a new point of view on the old laws. <laughs> so somehow that's what I'm trying to do. And you can touch it. It is not axiom. You can touch every piece of construction. You see? If you wish. If you don't want to touch, mm -hmm. you can trust and we go on. Mm. Okay. Now, yeah. let me ask Donald, are you here? Yes, I'm here. May I ask you to, ah, last thing. Maybe there are questions. 
Yes. So it's a lambda deformation, kind of uh, deformation on the boundary. Why no. is that? No. No, lambda deformation is a deformation of the instantonic equation. Mm -hmm. Instead of right, if, instead of saying that you have holomorphic map, you have deformed map. Okay. And uh, for the constant map, you deform constant map to something like this. Mm -hmm. So actual solution to lambda deformation is, so here we have this omega. You see, this omega is not that omega. This is a solution for general omega. It was the simplest example. You can always solve this example. Okay. Here I am advocating for lambda deformation in general. So tomorrow I'll come to so-called AIB approach and we will see the same objects from the different perspective. More conventionally, more conventionally written. Okay. okay. You see, I am I am showing you the sphere from the North Pole, from the South Pole, from equator, you see. What I'm trying to explain you spheres. Uh, in different charts, okay? So this is lambda deformation. And these, these the derivatives are, would correspond, uh, you see, I want the formula to have the left-hand side and the right-hand side. No. This derivative equals to correlator of O omega one O tilde observable corresponding to the vector field V at point Y. This is not, you can see, in the books. This is a new definition. And I will show you how it works. When we will come to free fields here. In some particular example. Last thing. This definition does not, okay, I need to stress it. does not need free fields. But in order to compute something, it's better to use coordinates or something like free fields. So the definition is invariant, okay? You see, it's like a linear algebra. You can define everything in the basis free way. However, in order to compute determinant, it's better to pick up a basis here, or there, and write down the matrix. So free fields are like matrices, okay? You know that linear algebra is a basis independent tool. But in computation, you need matrices. So uh, think here. this definition does not need free fields. 
Mm -hmm. So we maybe want to consider holomorphic maps as a vacuum. It's like uh, your expectation value. Oh, holomorphic maps is something around which you have expectation value. Instead yes. of functional integral, you have a finite dimensional integral of a holomorphic maps. Right. And uh, hom holomorphic maps or deformed holomorphic maps. And all correlators are expressed as operations applied to it. Mm -hmm. So I understand your problems because uh, when we started to do this, it was not obvious how this can work. You see, three field approach is uh, written in 100 books. This approach is only in uh, my papers with Frankel and Nikrasov. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll continue tomorrow night at eight. Okay, tomorrow yes. night at eight, yes. Please yes. tell us an announcement. Okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So finish today. Yes. Okay, so I will stop the recording now. Yes, yes. please not, not only stop recording, but send recording to to me and to Sanhu and to Pavel.